The 2024 NFL Draft is a wrap and there is so much to get to. The Athletics' Nate Tice settles into the Cigar Lounge to give us his takes on the draft as a whole, QB philosophy, winners and losers, and how he views the Seahawks draft class. Let's light him up. I'm Jackson Bevins, and this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins, and along with my austere producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts Podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? We're doing well, Jackson. We're recuperated after an insane few days. The draft is in the books, and the Seahawks have a new draft class on their hands. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, man. And the thing that I'm trying to keep in mind is there's still some moves that may be happening. So it's like, true. this is the, the part of the off season where you want to kind of like close the book. And these are the guys moving forward. But it's a reminder that there's still a lot of signings out there. There's still a lot of players that are free agents. There are undrafted players who are going to end up on rosters. And I got to think, man, there's still a couple of uh, potential reunions in the secondary. Sure, looking like it. Uh, Bob Condota, friend of the show, has just reported that the Seahawks remain in contact with Jamal Adams. So there are other teams that are in contact with him as well, but a potential reunion may be in the works. Man, y'all know how much I'd be into that. Quandre digs as well. And look, man, it was the draft that I think most Seahawks fans are feeling pretty good about. And we are going to dive into everything shortly, but first... I want to remind everyone listening that Cigar Thoughts is proud to be sponsored by Seattle Cigar Concierge and Glenfiddich Single Malt Scotch Whiskey, two companies of incredible quality and whose products I consume on a regular basis. And the big news, those of you who listened and watched during the draft, you already know we have teamed back up with the Seattle Cigar Concierge for an exciting second release of the Cigar Thoughts Cigars. That's right. It's the Cigar Thoughts Red Zone Series, which combines a robust taste profile with a smooth Connecticut wrapper and will be available to purchase using the link on the show page for the same discounted price of $149 for a bundle of 10 stogies that you're used to with the Cigar Thoughts Originals. As always, you can catch the full episode on YouTube and of course, listen to it everywhere you get your podcasts. And now we welcome in a dear friend of mine, and someone who combines a unique perspective that comes from a history of playing, coaching, scouting, and analyzing football. He is the Athletics' Nate Tice. Nate, welcome back, brother. How you doing? From a fantasy perspective, from a a fantasy uh, co-owner, I should say co-owner because we don't own the same team, but fellow opponent? Opponent? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fellow competitor in the same fantasy league, but thank you for that introduction. Yes. Many hats. Yeah, Nate... That, that that's the bulk of me and Nate's uh, interactions. Trade offers is, uh, is fantasy trade <laughs> that that offend trade. each other, and then we just go. This might get a little then, then, No, 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 no. We're very we're very cordial about it. It's very a lot of offensive offers both ways, and then a lot mm-hmm. of like, no, I can't do that right now. That's the passive and aggressiveness like, I love. Yeah, I understand. See, that's the thing. you know what? I'm fr- I was born in Bellevue, grew up you know Maple Valley for a few years, but then I I do I did grow up in Minneapolis. Like you know I have that Minneapolis. Passive aggressive Minnesota nice. Like I just have that little bit of element in there. No, it's it's nice. And you know what? Since we're on the subject, and I know there's a lot of people listening that play fantasy football, don't get offended by trade offers. That's no. that's high school shit. Just if you're I not into it, that. keep that keep that conversation open, right? Because if you get all pissy and then the other person doesn't ever want to do a deal with you next time they have a player you're interested in. They're shutting the door because you right. were a dick last time. Like, yes, there are offensive offers out there. I've received them. I've sent them. Just keep the conversation going. It's fine. It's fine. And then you strike gold. And then you get a win-win. Yeah. You get a lot. But don't be like super offensive. Like, this is what I do for a living. I, I negotiate for a living with my job. And there definitely is like coming in too low. <laughs> but <laughs> just like, really what you're doing is identifying the players you're The b for the four. Yeah, well, that's in. just the feeler. That's the worm that they put out there. You <laughs> yeah. can't put out the good bait. You know, instantly. You know, I can't give you a lave. I can give you like A. T. Perry. 
you know, like <laughs> right, right. if I want one hundred and four. Yeah, I, yeah. I ended up get I ended up getting a lave from him, but it cost me my entire draft pretty much. So <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. I'm excited. I'm really excited. Yeah, and that's I, why. Do. What's that realize? Because I'm always like, oh, those drafts are so far away. They're so far away. Right. And then the draft happens. I'm like, holy shit, that's ten days away. And I get like almost kind of like excited again. But this yeah. is my life. This is my thirties. Yeah. This is what I get excited so for. Good. I got a new board so game good, too. Man. I got really unwrap that. That one's a good one. Huge. <laughs> it's, it's huge. I'm thriving. I'm yeah. thriving right now <laughs> nate, nate and i are in three somehow we ended up in three right. dynasty leagues together uh including one it's loaded with a bunch of industry guys and and nate won one let's mm-hmm. see two years ago i won one last year and uh i won another one hopefully this year. one of us will take down the traders uh, traders alley league this year yeah that's why i needed the traders i always won is i needed a revamp that was a i had a very much a colts team for a while i needed my anthony richardson I don't know too many B. I have too many B players, but uh, no, yeah. the one I probably put together one the strong. I'll say I'll go on record. My one and the one, the one with Mina and Danny, dude. That that one it was like one of the strongest fantasy teams of all time. Just yes. three, just three down volume running backs like down everyone's throat. <laughs> just maddening. just down everybody's throat. Just maddening. <laughs> yeah. And Josh yeah. Allen to sprinkle on top. <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? Well, listen. Well, this is what everyone uh, cares why, about. Why, let's, our fantasy yeah. drafts. One hundred percent. This is great content. This is this is how we should lead every show. Now let's get to the less important draft, the one that happened in the NFL over oh, the weekend. Right. <laughs> Nate, I know how deep. I mean, you your bread is buttered in large part your ability to identify and evaluate non headline players. And I want to just start super zoomed out. Your overall draft impressions, like philosophically, and, and just to give you an idea, the one thing that stood out to me about this draft was that the trade down market at the top of this draft was not what I anticipated. And I think it speaks to just how deep the top maybe 20, 25 players in this class really were. Yeah, I, I think that's what happens with trade ups usually too, is they identify a guy that they maybe value more than others. I think this class was there's quarterbacks, there's offensive linemen, offensive tackles, and receivers. Usually, the guys you get tra- that or the trade ups happen for, and so mm-hmm. I think where I, where a lot of people, uh, a lot of teams, were like, well, if I don't get Joe Alt, I'll get J.C. Latham. If I don't get M- Marvin Harrison Jr., I'll get Malik Neighbors or Roman Dudze. And then quarterbacks is kind of its own thing because uh, to me, the discussion does not include Penix and Knicks uh, standing pat and doing those types of things. But uh, you know that that's a whole a whole other discussion. Uh, but that I, I think is what happened is that there's premium talent at the most important positions that are getting paid. So I think a lot of teams are like, wait, aren't, well, do we take a bunch of picks to try and get one of these guys? Like that's what the whole point was. Like you usually try and accumulate capital to acquire a player at one of these positions, and so they're like, why overthink it? I'll just stand pat and, and just take the guys that we think could be premium guys, elite guys at like the top, hardest positions to find elite guys. Well, you look at, I mean. I don't think there's a better case, even though they technically traded up. I don't think there is someone that went counter to expectation any more than the team that your dad used to coach in the Minnesota Vikings. There was so much in term. I mean, everybody was assuming they were going up to two, three, four, or five to get their quarterback. And there's a lot of smoke around it being JJ McCarthy. End of the day, they ended up switching around some day three picks to move up one spot from 11 to 10 and getting one of those guys anyway. And to me, I, I was just saying, and, and I think I'm a bit higher on, on Penix than you were, but my thought was there's going to be one of those quarterback sets at 11. I got no problem with seeing McCarthy as a better player than one of those guys, but is he two extra first round picks better than that player? I didn't think so. No. And clearly Minnesota didn't either. Yeah, it, how it ended up for him makes a lot more sense. Even if they took him at 11, I know they bumped up to 10, but it's just whatever. Mm-hmm. If they just stood there, took McCarthy, there's no fluff that they made the second or acquired the second first rounder. You don't at the end of the day you'd be like, "Yeah, they they drafted their new guy, they drafted their new potentially their new Kirk, who's young, who they hope they can, you know, grow in a really good offensive ecosystem." Uh, but also like there's, it was more the, the other first round pick that they moved up for and did all that, that I think it was like kind of stunned people. Uh, I, I think it was mm-hmm. the Dallas Turner is a hell of a player. I think it mm-hmm. just becomes the discussions as it's broken all the trade charts, but also I think, uh, Questy, their office or their office quarter, their general manager 
actually has brought up an interesting point, kind of like, well, we just value the player more than the capital we give up, which is just a yeah. whole other discussion, and, yeah. and which sometimes I I agree with, because trust me, as, as someone that plays fantasy, someone's been around normal football, that's sometimes how it happens. You have to pay yeah. a little bit of premium, knowing you're kind of getting that thing you think it is, even if it is a prospect and all that. So I, I, I still think the Vikings acquired all that with Drake May in mind. Like, I, I think that was their guy. They wanted a guy that was different than what they thought they had. They said the Kirk Cousins got us to here with this kind of mm-hmm. surroundings. Mm-hmm. So I think May was the guy to kind of venture him forward. And when the pa- Patriots go, we like May too, that they kind of, they had nothing more. It's like, all right, we got these two first. And then the Patriots go, oh, we don't want to go back to 11. And I think maybe they just, the, the Patriots did the same thing with the initial discussion that there's no trade backs. They're just like, well, this is what we're trying to get is trying to get one of these guys by requiring all these resources. So let's just not overthink it and do it and then figure it out afterwards. So that's a hap- that's what happens sometimes is you have a great plan. You have to have a plan B. And sometimes that others don't want to cooperate. Others, you have a great plan. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, they're going to trade with us. And sometimes the trade partner just goes, shop's closed. And okay, shit. <laughs> you know, okay, right. but that's why, you know, these decision makers, I think McCarthy was a great backup plan for – how it happened, how it unfolded, where it fell back to them at 11 slash 10. How much do you think, and I, I say this recognizing it's going to vary, of course, from front office to front office, but how much do GMs, how much stock do they tend to put into these trade charts? And I know there's kind of four or five out there that are considered sort of you know standard, but I mean, are there teams that are just vibes only and others that are kind of like married to, to draft chart? Where... Where are most teams falling on that spectrum? I think the smarter teams, long run, try to at least break even on the charts or acquire mm-hmm. the smaller or be on the profitable side. But it's mm-hmm. not to win every single trade. It's to win every single, it's to win the overall uh, surplus or profitability. So one might be, wow, shoot, we we acquired the equivalent of a third rounder on that one. And then sometimes it's like, okay, we lost the equivalent of a fifth rounder on that one. Okay, but overall, that means we acquired a fourth rounder just based on the points and all the value and stuff. So to me, it's not just being at the, I, I think you don't want to be on the bottom end, like a Mickey Loomis with the Saints, where it's just like, you know, <laughs> permanently burning picks and with no plan yeah. because just whatever, charge it to the credit card. I, I think, and uh, sometimes the ones at the top are, they just only make a couple picks, which is something you could do as well. Only trade back, you know, the John Schneider for years was just always moved yes. back a bunch of times. Chris Boward right now with the Colts. There is a method to that. But at some points, at, at some times, you need a dude. Like you need guys. You need needle movers. So the guys that I think do it best are kind of more in the middle, where they they do do move back, but at times they strike and they move up and they use those resources they got to get the guy they want. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I I think that there's the old school, and and I'm I'm generalizing here, but there's the old school football guy mentality that's like, go get your player. And then you've got the spreadsheet mentality that's like, make sure that you're winning on the chart. And I think I I tend to actually be that way. Like, I want to feel like my aggregate value at the end of my wheeling and dealing is greater than where I started. Whatever lens I choose to view that from. Mm -hmm. But you can't go too far the other way, right? Like, I actually loved what the Cardinals did by staying at four. I'm sure they got some pretty tasty offers, but they already had six picks in the top 90. And (laughs) at some point, you can't just put future picks on the field. You got to line guys up and they got to be able to play. And so I, I applaud them for saying, you know what? We think that we can get the best non-quarterback in this draft. We've already got our quarterback. We've got a bunch of other picks. Let's just let's just take this guy. Especially after they got real cute last year and it worked out great. Yeah. But they did get really cute last year and there was a lot of talk that maybe they'd, you know, trade back to a team that wants quarterback and then try and trade back up and still get Marvin. They just took their guy and I yeah. I tip my hat to them. No, that Cardinals are a great example of this, but both yeah, you brought it all up. What happened last year too with the Paris Johnson stuff, where they moved back, moved back up, or moved back, then went back up into the top ten. And I, I liked what they did that, and they still accumulated capital on that, and got a very good player who's going to be kind of a, you know, building block, a true building block for that team for a while. And Paris Johnson, I, uh, I'm glad they they just took Harrison Jr. It was just kind of don't overthink it, just take the dude, take the guy that could be well, 99 for, overall for a fan base that fell in love with one of my all-time favorite players. You have Larry Fitzgerald for so long. Yeah. Then you lose him. And like you got Kyler. Kyler Kyler's a jersey seller, 
right? Yeah. Like your yeah. team's got to have some Jersey sellers yes. at the end of the day. Yes. And Kyler's a Jersey seller, but like there's been that vacuum there, like real star power alongside Kyler. DeAndre Hopkins had a good couple of years there. Of course, I'm sure that was popular, but Marvin Harrison Jr. has a chance to be like a legacy franchise defining player. I'm not putting that on him right now, but that's within his range of outcomes. Yep. And at some point, there's just so much peripheral value to have. It's one of the reasons I love DK Metcalf. I mean, I think he holds up statistically and, and, you know, player profile wise and all that. But at the end of the day, he's a cool fucking player and <laughs> right. kids want to be DK Metcalf and they want to have his Jersey. And I think that there's real value to a franchise in that. So I, I liked what the Cardinals did there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, shoot, just even look what's going on in Chicago right now with uh, mm. Caleb Williams in, in Rome. It, it's just that they, they're, they have magnetic personalities and they're owning it. Like they yeah. are, well, I do think the zoomers are going to save us, but it's like, they, they are, they are, <laughs> they are owning it, man. Like these guys have been so comfortable with the camera. And that's also just something too, that I, it's really clicked for me is they've been on camera their whole life. You know, we, yeah. we were kind of talking some generational stuff before this in a good way, uh, but yeah. just, they're just so comfortable on it that it's really cool to see these guys come from college and they're making up hand signals for an entire city. Have you seen that? They're like doing the bear now. Yeah. They're like so doing cool. say, and they just do it on the spot. They're like laughing about it. They own it, but it's just how much that having the actual guy, like people aren't going to wear jerseys that say you know for you know pick one hundred two on it that we just acquired. It's not going to say pick one hundred five like on the back there. They're going to get whoever the actual selection Cash is. Cash considerations, yeah, <laughs> player to be named later. <laughs> You know, something like that. You're not going to hang the banner for for surplus added, like you know, a draft valley chart, the Pittsburgh. You know, Spielberg chart, you know, all those types of things. Jimmy Johnson chart. <laughs> yeah. Like that. They don't hang just different colored banners. The, just raising raising them up. the banner for Raise most draft we, capital. We, surf, third round surplus. Third round surplus, guys. Yeah. Like, but that it, at some point, that that's great. It, what the why did you trade back you, the, the bites of the apple theory of all this? Yep. Bites of the apple too, in my mind, is you're accumulating a war chest. You're accumulating things and means to do things. That mm-hmm. that's what dra- getting picks and doing and having money and having uh, a salary cap, you know, cap space. That's what it's, it's not just to have the most. It's right. to push it, but then also give yourself ways to do other things. That's why Howie Roseman's Howie Roseman. You know, look at their they're pushing it to the max right now. He's trading back, but he's also trading up. He traded back up for Cooper mm-hmm. DeGene in the second round. You know, at times you strike. Um, he bumped up one spot for Carter last year. He's moved up. Uh, he moved up a couple of years ago for uh, Devontae Smith. Like at times he's going to strike when, when, when it, when he thinks it's a true needle moving guy. The thing is though, you, you better be right. <laughs> that That is the only other flip yeah. side of it. But generally uh, uh, if you, the, having those picks gives you a little bit of safety net in case you are wrong. Going like, okay, maybe that guy that we moved up to in the second round wasn't right, but we got this two thirds and a fourth to maybe make it better. For a front office, okay. So and and for context, I'm going to talk about the Seahawks, right? John Schneider showed up, blaze of glory, right? 2010 through 2012. You're talking about a combined AAV over three drafts that's maybe unmatched in the history of of tracking average annual value uh for for draft picks right three hall of fame classes in a row and then kind of like duds in four of the next five how much of drafting well is a skill that some front offices have versus are you just getting lucky week to week and i mean i'm, I'm sure that answer lands on a spectrum and if it does Who's your podium or your Mount Rushmore of uh, franchises that really draft well going in each oh. week? You're giving them the benefit of the doubt. One team, well, I'll start with the second question first. One team that else has been kind of, I think, underrated in their drafting is the Bucks. They've hmm. actually been like, done a good job. Just like Jason Light, just like over the time, just keeps nailing players. And mm-hmm. it's just kind of, we just kind of forget about it. Like he just kind of hits a lot of, like his first rounders become a lot of good, very good, even yes. great players. And he acquires other guys. He gets the Antoine Winfield or juniors in the second round. He gets all these kind of guys. So uh, Carlton Davis, you know, just good starter. So he's one that I, I think has been kind of underrated. Um, the Cowboys are actually a really good drafting team, believe it or not, uh, especially mm-hmm. under Will McCain. Uh, like they, they do a lot of just don't overthink it. Other stuff with that team, we'll we'll, we'll leave it. We'll leave it up to there. <laughs> uh, I think some of it um, is consistency to you know your I wouldn't say your system, but your thresholds. 
I, I think the ones that do that end up having the most success. The ones that kind of go vibes and don't look at historical factors are the ones that fail. <laughs> uh, sure. So there's nothing with like, uh, uh, there's not like certain data points that I would like just go like, oh, this guy went to the senior bowl. Oh, he was a two time captain. Those teams, like, you know, some teams value that a lot. Like the Eagles, I actually think have some blemishes with that when they value that a little too much. But I think teams like the Packers, the Ron Wolf teams over the years, mm-hmm. they kind of hit on guys that others don't, especially at offensive line. Because they have really strong thresholds that they stick to and never, ever waver from. And when you're consistent like that and you have belief in that, there's kind of some can be proof in the pudding. So I, I think the, uh, uh, yeah. So if you were kind of just going like that, those are the ones I kind of really, I, I wouldn't say admire, but kind of go like, yeah, I like how they do it. The other mm-hmm. one would be the Ravens too, because they are the kings of don't yes. overthink it. And that's part of their whole belief. And they use, you know, um, public data as part of their stuff too, to just kind of go like, are we, you know, Principal Skinner meme it. No, it's the kids who are it's wrong. The kids who are wrong. No, but it's like that's what they they kind of do that a lot. Go like, are we? You know, kind of are we up our own ass kind of thing? <laughs> you know, kind of like. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you want that because uh, there's so much groupthink that happens and, and and inside your own building, and it's it's hard when you're part of a team and you have to have belief in a sport like this that can fluctuate so much depending on certain factors and you know with injuries and all these different things that inside the building kind of have to have that kind of like, hey, we're all in this together. We're all in lockstep. But also sometimes you want to be like, all right, let's hope, hopefully we're not kind of like just really, you know, really getting the group thing going on. Like we really think we're smarter than everybody else. So sometimes you kind of need that little outside perspective too. Just make sure all that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot because one of the things that I think about a lot every year at draft time, that is, I don't know, I, if, if it is a part of the discourse, I've missed it. It's that oftentimes you have 50, 60, sometimes 70 year old people making decisions on a locker room that's going to be composed primarily of 20 year old people. Right. And, and being aware of that generational divide, you know, before we started recording, Mike and Nate and I were, were talking about, you know, the differences in our parents' generation versus now and, and all of these things. And and I think it's important to remember that a lot of these front office types, they, they grew up without all of this readily available information that we take for granted. And it's hard to all of a sudden say, especially since, you know, this is something you said in one of our group chats, Nate, that the vast majority of GMs are former scouts and scouts have a very specific lens, especially the older ones that wish they view football. And it's hard to all of a sudden see these people who aren't necessarily football guys show up and start a website and start telling them they're wrong with the decisions they're making because they don't meet some analytical threshold, right? And so Mm -hmm. if you can try and incorporate that, I do think that there is a lot of value. I think it was one of the great market inefficiencies that Pete Carroll was able to exploit when he was, you know, not only the coach of the Seahawks, but a high-ranking executive for the Seahawks is not the ability and the desire to connect with, with these younger players and and let me ask you this, because I want to talk about the QBs. <clears throat> we we're talking about the Zoomers and Gen Z earlier. You know, uh, Nate, you were you were a, a highly recruited quarterback coming out of high school. You played D1 college football. Loose term, highly. Uh, Hi, I, I was recruited. <laughs> well, let's, I no, mean, we'll you're a quarterback for University of Wisconsin. Right? There we go. You, there we go. You, I, you were uh, more highly recruited than, say, I was. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, so yes, technically, you're correct. <laughs> So how how much of that and and we can talk about quarterbacks or just just the top uh, players overall. How much has that experience changed going from being a precocious middle school high school football player looking to transition to college, which wasn't that long ago for you, versus the guys like Caleb Williams who are coming in now? Oh, well, so that was right when I was in high school. Like Rivals was becoming a thing, Rivals dot com, mm-hmm. and so you could see it already happening then. The Nike camp started. You know the the, inter, the national Nike camps were you know regional ones I should say where you can kind of get noticed. It's like basically an open combine and workout and stuff like that. Not open, you get invited to it. Uh, that all started happening when I was in like high school, so that was like the mid aughts. Like you know, I, I graduated in 07. so mm-hmm. yeah. So I would say I remember like maybe oh three oh four that stuff started happening. Maybe a little bit before Spark, you know, stuff like that. Like TJ Duckett broke the Spark record, and that was like a huge <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah, it, it's. There's just so much now, um, but I I think it's good and also it's just awful <laughs> in other ways. You know, there's yeah. so much stuff and there like anything like you said seven on seven yeah guys get skills but then there's also kind of the AAU component like meaning like just you know the handlers uh, that you kind of sometimes can get a little messy. I think that 
there's been a movement a little bit coaching wise at the very least. Maybe it's just it's not just the Shanahan guys, but just other guys too. Uh, even the head coach now of the Seahawks. There's kind of a youth movement right now with coaches, yeah. and there's more. I mean, there are there are age, uh, and they yeah. are more understanding of bridging that gap. Because the Madden real- generation is coaching now. Yes, and I think it's been great. I think yeah. they're open. I also think there's little things too, like something that I mean, I kind of like share this thought anywhere is I thought it was very fascinating, even more than usual. Up until the last minute, there's so much more false information this year or stuff that didn't come to fruition, even more than usual. And that might be anecdotal, but it's just, I kind of, I thought maybe some of the information gatherers got played like a fiddle a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because this new generation knows what they're doing and they kind of know like it's kind of like we're getting meta now like it's like yeah. they're kind of you <laughs> yeah. know like it's yeah. it's the game is it's a new game and i think they're so exposed to it we have a whole bunch of coaches that played madden their whole lives they're not just like they're not in their own little bubble you got you had so many of these coaches from my dad's age that were you know maybe just high school coaches in texas and went to high school football in texas and then coached in texas and played in texas and also now i'm the linebacker coach for the seahawks you know, like right. just like going from Seattle to, you know, maybe Lubbock, Texas, you know, but now it's like, these guys have so much exposure to everything. There's so much information shared, like me sharing clips on Twitter. That's unheard of 10 years ago, all right. 22 film available to the public. And now everybody's got it. So just saying that totally. that had to chap some serious asses when that was happening. I think it was, they didn't realize one, they didn't realize how much of a market there would be for it. I think over time. And then two, I also think they didn't realize what people could do with it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They're just like, you only could use our website. If anyone's using an NFL.com product, they, you know, it's like, you know, they're they're kind of, some functionality can kind of be iffy, especially if you got an ad blocker on there. Please don't arrest me. But it was just one of these, uh, uh, (laughs) but it's one of those with when you kind of like look at at those things. I think there's just more of a bridging happening now. Like, I just really think that's, and other sports it's happened. NBA it's happened. Baseball kind of happened in some ways, but I think it's kind of gotten good now. I think there's kind of been a backlash to some of the like ruthlessness of baseball. (laughs) So I think that, you know, yeah. So I think that's kind of reverting back, even just looking at rule changes. But I think football Mm -hmm. is going through right now. And I think it's great. Uh, Just this hybrid hybridization of ideas and everything. Totally. So with specifically with these quarterbacks, uh, another thing, you know, we talked at the top about like kind of overall themes with this draft. The other thing that really stood out to me, besides there not being the trade down market at the top of of this draft that we're used to seeing recently, is how important not only having your quarterback of now is, but your quarterback of just in case is. And I mean, obviously, we saw an extreme example of that with Atlanta. They took their quarterback of the future in the top 10. After, you know, paying their quarterback of now hundred yep. million guaranteed. And that's, I mean, we could do a whole show on that, but to use that as, like I said, as an extreme example, that's very one end of the spectrum. But last year, what did we have four, five teams where their quarterback started all 17 games? Right. Like, I think teams understand now your backup quarterback is going to play and we can't just be paying that dude $700,000 a year. Like, we can't have our season just be over if our quarterback gets concussed or or blows out a knee or or something like that, right? Like obviously, if your starter goes down and he's done for the season, sure, you might get a Nick Foles situation or a Case Keenum situation that comes in and, and saves the day, but that's not a reasonable expectation. What you are hoping for is if my quarterback's out for a month, can my backup go two and two and keep the season afloat? Is there still a reason for people to be tuning into this games? Is, is Twitter going to be aflame with, I can't believe we're watching Easton stick versus Nick Mullins on Monday night type of thing. Right? So we're seeing teams really start to invest in that. We saw six quarterbacks go in the top 12 of this draft is the perspective of the quarterback position changing. And are we going to start seeing backups being taken with higher draft capital and be given more money moving forward? Or is this a little bit more of an outlier year in that regard? I think it's somewhat of an outlier year. I also think it's the, the team set up this year. Uh, uh, Mm -hmm. The Broncos were desperate and that's because they just like, you know, just love punching themselves in the nuts. Like that's just like, (laughs) so that's like, they're addicted to it. So I, uh, that, that, so like that team right there, I've just, uh, okay, boom. Top two pick, top three picks. I think it was also a class of, to me, there's two 
true, true blue chip guys and Caleb Williams and Drake May, and then a very interesting first round type and and Jane Daniels, and then another interesting, I consider it more like an early second that you can inflate into maybe the twenties, they end up going 10, 11, which is like it's quarterback tax, how it's how it goes. Yep. That but that's another one. So that's like to me three and a half first round quarterbacks. We'll just call it that. Last year, same thing, about three and a half first round quarterbacks, right. give or take. However you feel about Bryce, Bryce Young, Levis, whatever. Overall, some people were lower on Richardson, but it seemed overall you had at least two, maybe three guys and include like make an interesting project in there. Then you just got the class before where it was just like, I guess we take Pickett. But then yeah. in that class, everybody was like, I'm not touching anyone in the second because if you take a quarterback in the second, you're basically taking them in the first to the fans. Yes. You're getting the... Yep. Why aren't you playing this guy? Hey, you took him at 42. Like that, it just becomes that, but you took him in the second for a reason. They have some flaws. They have some component about him that you didn't take him in the first. Um, so I think that's kind of there's kind of a new thinking of it. It's kind of like first or nothing. It was like it's either first or take him way longer, way later. Like in that draft, it was Pickett, who got overdrafted, but then Ritter, um, Matt Corral. Malik Willis, they all went in the That's third. Right. Sam Howell in the fifth. And and so, but I mean, those guys were getting talked about first rounder. I think it just yes, all becomes, depends on the class. You know, I think next year's class, just kind of taking the first glance at it, you squint, there's maybe two or three guys, but it's not like mm-hmm. this year where there's like, going into this year, there was like, it was easy. It was two guys and wow, we might have up to six. Me already in uh, April 29th, 2024 a year ahead I, i'm like oh i'm squinting the look ahead is like maybe there's one or two guys that i'd feel good about at the end of this but again sure. but just kind of just knowing all that it just all depends on the classes like even like a, a different position i know we're talking about quarterbacks but receivers we're kind of thinking oh there's gonna be a good receiver class every year last year was kind of iffy this year was awesome and then next year i'm looking and it's kind of like there's a couple interesting guys but not like this year where going into last year i knew there was like four guys i'd like in this class so i think it's just case by case even if maybe it's also just the value of them. Yeah, take them in the first, but if you don't take them in the first, just wait a little later. Yeah. You know, one of the things we talked about a lot during uh, the draft as we were kind of reacting live to everything that was unfolding is the Packers model. And and there's only been one team that hasn't had to worry about quarterback for 30 years, and, and it's Green Bay. And the reason is that they've used first-round picks when they've had an established starter. And both of those first-round picks, Aaron Rodgers, who I think went 21st overall, Jordan Love, went, I believe, 26th overall, uh, sat behind this established Hall of Fame quality starter for three years and spitting in the face of you have to maximize, you know, the biggest market inefficiency in the NFL in American sports is a starting quarterback on a rookie contract. You have to take advantage of it. Packers just said, fuck that. We've got our guy, but we're going to let this guy develop. And and I think Rodgers was considered as him versus Alex Smith as maybe the number one overall pick that year. I think the Rodgers slide was really surprising, but with love, you know, he got some looks when Rodgers got hurt uh, during his career and he did not look like the guy. And I think it speaks to now, you know, you see him last year in the second half of last year, he looked like a top five quarterback in this league. And so, it, it speaks to these guys really can develop if you put them in the right situation. Oh, yeah. Did the Falcons go too far with that, with Michael Penix? Yes, they did. Uh, I was just even because uh, I, I always try to look at both sides, but they did. I uh, understand the thinking, but also the process was just, it, it's sloppy. Um, because say if you, if you have like Penix, like you, you are high on them. Your Penix is your number two guy on your board. Uh, you don't get there, that thinking in March. You probably think that earlier. You think that, December is when you have your first big scouting meeting. So that's when you kind of put your first board together uh, is December. Mm -hmm. So I'm not guessing that Penix went from six to two from December to now. There's no way. He had to start high. So if you already identified that, we know this guy. Hey, our season isn't going great. They knew they had the number eight pick at the beginning of January. But they still invested all those resources in Cousins. If they took Penix on day two, I would totally get it. I'd be like, hey, you know, like I get that. Even, I mean, even maybe trading up to like 30, you know, back up at 130 to somebody and getting sure. them in the first thing. I can, I can argue it. I can argue it. No, it's the, every trade value chart you look at, the graph drops off. Top 10 mm-hmm. picks are extremely valuable. They are yeah. extremely, because you're getting the best. Everyone wants more bites at the apple. You get the biggest, best bite of the apple. You get the juiciest bit without the worm. And so I think... Also, looking at those other teams, 
the Packers. Packers are kind of their own thing because they have no owner. Uh, mm-hmm. But they are were playoff teams that were yep. had an established core. They don't have to add too much more. The Falcons added Kirk Cousins. They still need a lot of defenders. They still needed a second outside receiver. They still needed maybe offensive line depth. They still needed pieces, pieces, pieces. So like they could have used number eight or traded back from number eight to to you know acquire those pieces or give them themselves means to do it. So I also think just the salary situation. They signed Cousins and then they're like, okay, now we got we got Penix at eight. All right, if best case is two years of Cousins, then Cousins also has a no trade clause. But it, it, so two years of Cousins. Okay, maybe if we move on from Cousins, Panix is going to be a first-year starter at 26 going on 27, and his cap hit will be about 30-something mil because you're including Cousins' dead cap. So you're kind of setting them up just for a hard situation. Their Panix does have qualities. I, I, I like. I love how aggressive he is. I love he pushes the ball like I do. It's just that he was considered where he was at for a reason because just of his player profile, his age, um, some of the creation stuff, and just the medical stuff for a reason. And so yeah. I just think the... The idea and the thinking is a an argument that you can make, but how they went about it was kind of like they got to that thinking afterwards. They did not start this process with like, we're going to get our nice guy, the next guy of the future. We're going to involve Kirk in this process and make sure he knows so he's not fired up about this. It's just, to me, it seemed like vibes. They didn't bring him in for a top 30, which it's like, you don't have to, right. but Penix, Penix has finished four of his seasons hurt. Like yeah. you, you bring him in even just for medicals, just to make sure. Like you're investing a top 10 pick in this guy. I got to just make sure. Um, So yeah, it just, it's weird. It was a weird process to me. And it just like, I keep, I I really wanted to find like a better argument for it that I can maybe just be like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I could see why they did this way. Their particular situation did not make sense to me of where they're at as a team, how they invested in cousins and then the investment they're making in Penix. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if if I'm hearing you correctly, it, what you're saying is not even so much a criticism of Penix. It's the process that went into this because I do think I don't Atlanta's hate Mike Penix. I hate the idea of this move that they. It could yeah, be, it could have been like anyone, even like McCarthy. I'd be like, I was okay, just going to ask. He's 21. I get it, but like, really at eight? You know, mm-hmm. like that's that's a very precious resource to use to go like your successor. Again, Love was taken in the 20s. Like, you know, That's like right. it's, it's like, it's, it's different. It just is different. Or if you want to bring up the Russell Wilson, when he was drafted, this is a supercharged version. That's a third rounder. And Matt Flynn's contract was not Kirk Cousins's contract right now. <laughs> so right. it's just, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. To I, I it. think for me, you know, I'm, I'm all for getting your next quarterback yep. early. I'm, I'm even into overspending for it. If you really believe in the guy, it's just a tier point. The opportunity cost at yep. eight is That's it. so damn high it's so they're, th- they're trying high. to thread a needle here when yeah really when you're drafting a quarterback like that you're giving yourself options they're kind of going mm-hmm. like well this has to happen and this happens to happen this and also the last thing is that they're kind of overconfident that they're going well we're gonna be picking in the 20s all right uh, kirk cousins is, is a good starting quarterback it's called the kirk cousins tier for a reason yeah it's not yep. sitting behind aaron Rodgers. aaron Rodgers right. was an mvp winner it's so we're even cousins at best has he had a good year last year but as best has been considered what the seventh eighth best quarterback at best more yeah. like 12th to 14th always by general fans general people that actually sure. watch sure it's it's just it's it's the idea of the argument makes sense but the cast of characters they did it's like a it's a local stage play instead of freaking meryl streep and philip seymour hoffman and stuff like they just like <laughs> it's like it, yeah. it's just that's what i'm like i'm trying to like I, I understand what they're trying to—they're trying to argue, but just what they're at, what actually did and who's involved has not given me like kind of like a lot of like, yeah. It's more like no, <laughs> just well, all I the don't, way. <laughs> I, I mean, to your point, I don't think there's a quarterback in history. I don't think there's a player in history that speaks to the demand for competence at the position than Kirk Cousins does, who's by the time he's done, will have made $400 million <laughs> with so far one playoff win. Right. But, yeah. but you know, your floor, your floor is X. Like you yes. will be competitive yep. with Kirk Cousins. If you do everything else, right. Kirk Cousins is good enough, but with Kirk Cousins, you have to do everything else right. That's Versus, right. to take another extreme example, Patrick Mahomes. The Chiefs were so flawed this past year. So flawed in so many ways. And it ultimately didn't matter. They 
they beat what I think was the most talented roster in the NFL in the 49ers simply because they had Patrick Mahomes really and, good. of course, the defense that, you know, played sick. its best football at the right time. That yeah. That's not to be overlooked, but, you know, that's that's exactly it. Right? And, 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 and that's at the crux of the point that I'm making is you need to have a certain baseline level of competence. And, and Kirk Cousins is, like, the best at the baseline level quarterbacks. Right. But but there's a ceiling high floor, a little bit lower ceiling. Uh, you know, even a lower floor than I think people are realizing. He doesn't have Justin Jefferson. He's 36. Yeah, he's 36. Mm-hmm. And just coming off a torn Achilles. That's such a brutal injury. It's not an ACL. ACLs have been like, yes, they're a tough injury, but they're now like, okay, it's more of a year injury, 16 months, you could fully recover. And Achilles is like a two year, even, and maybe, but you don't recover it like you do at 35, 36. You know, it's not That's like right. 22. It's just, and I which probably back. played into the situation to draft Penix, which is fine if you hadn't just paid a hundred million. That's it. And it also like your quarterback. Just, I know. And it's just like okay, that I was on Charles McDonald's show yesterday, and I was just like, because he's just a Falcons fan, and he's just like just about the, he's yeah he's yeah on, we've he, had him on the show, man. He's the best. I love he, he was not pleased. He's about to jump into the deep end, and uh, <laughs> I I go okay. The one argument I can make is that like they think Kirk Cousins' Achilles is not quite right which could be yeah. a possibility. He hasn't seen this. That's he fine. Not at eight, though. But then he goes, but then that means their trainers cleared him because you don't. And I was like, oh, my God, you're right. So even well, at if least, you do make that they argument. Drafted, at least they drafted a quarterback with a pristine medical history. Right. So, again, <laughs> it's like, again, again, if they took McCarthy, it's like, okay, you can make a little bit more arguments. It's just the, ca- sure, the, ca- yeah. the cast of characters did not That's fit right. what they're trying to do. <laughs> I think Look, Terry Fontenot might have made some calls to Washington, maybe try to move up to the number two. They wouldn't let him, and so he just wants to give Bob Myers a call down the road. Say, "How about two timelines now, buddy? Eight. How about two timelines now?" God, man, it, uh, it's, I'm glad it happens because it's just it's fascinating. I love experiments in the NFL. There are some really fun ones going on right now in the NFL. Good yeah, and bad, ain't good and bad. <laughs> ain't that the truth? Well, yeah. well, listen, you know, I selfishly, and I, I know a lot of the people listening want to know this too. Selfishly, I want to pick your brain because you have so much access not only to the industry and to the information surrounding it but you just know ball so uh selfishly i want to talk about the seahawks draft class here and i want to i want to gladly okay (laughs) we'll we'll start we'll start at the top um the way things were shaking out byron murphy is a player that on this show i circled as on my short list kind of a top two player that i wanted them to get and then as we got closer to the draft i'm like there's just no way he's going to be there right there's just no way and then they ended up getting him what was your initial reaction when seattle made that pick i nailed my initial mock and i got away from it uh, that mm. was my first thought i should have just stuck with my gut i love murphy seahawks for me for a minute were like where are they going with this? We're like, you know, new regime, kind mm-hmm. of an interesting roster because there are such good pieces, but then there's such weird holes. And so I'm kind of looking, okay, they invested a lot in the defensive line. Do they want to invest more? And then I kind of looked at the defensive line. And I'm like, they got a lot of sameness and mm-hmm. they got a lot of kind of beef and they got some kind of the ass kicker types. Murphy kind of makes sense there. You know, the more gap shooter, you want complementary pieces at all positions, but especially defensive line. So I was like, I, I kind of started thinking. So I started putting Byron Murphy there. Then he started getting, I, originally I had him about 20 on my big board. So and they were picking, you know, the teens. So I was like, okay, that's perfect. Then he started getting hyped like crazy. I thought he was my going to the Falcons for a minute. That way he was going up to eight and he was getting talks. So then I was like, oh, then he won't be there for the Seahawks. So I started giving him Graham Barton. And I, I love Graham Barton because I think he could have been an interior, sw- interior offensive lineman, interior swing guy. So I started out thinking this. But then at the end of the day, they get Byron Murphy and then Christian Haynes in the third. And I was like, that's even better because uh, you're, you're shoring up those two positions with, I think, are two really good starters. Uh, but I'll start with Murphy is that he, he's athletic. He's, he's, he's an explosive play. Uh, for, at the defensive line position, he can shoot the gap. What I think a is hallmark he, of Mike McDonald defenses. Well, what I think is what's cool with Mike McDonald is Murphy can line up at a few spots, and he's going to love that. This is his mm. Justin Matabike. I was and just going to ask if you thought this, this is was his Matabike. This is him. This is it. So he's got you know uh, boy you know Mafe like on the outside. That's his twitchy guy. That's his Awe. You know he's got he's got beef in the middle. He's got Draymond Jones, Leonard Williams, Reed. Hank, they signed Jonathan Hankins. I totally forgot about that. I like Hankins a lot. It's like a great yeah. beef nose tackle role, role yeah. player. He like saves the Cowboys defense when he's out there. But now he's not there anymore. Uh, but it's uh, but 
Murphy is the Matabike who is the guy. He's the finisher. He's the closer. He's the disruptor as everybody else pushes the pocket. And Matabike he, just got what, like 80 million guaranteed on yeah, the market? He, like, yeah. Like, so like when we're, money. I just want people listening to understand when we talk about Justin Matabike, this is, this is the level of value that if Murphy yes. hits that mark, they're getting. <laughs> This role can get unlocked by this defense, and that's why. And I think it made sense for the player, for where he got taken, and the scheme that just took him, and the coach that just took him. That's why it's one of these was like, yeah, like makes sense, love it, like absolutely love it. Not just because I'm on a, a Seahawks show, uh, and, and also I'm just you know, I just want to emphasize it again. It makes sense for where they're at defensive line wise. Like it just makes sense as far as bridging what you have and also complementing what you have on top of being a cherry on top type of player. Yeah, you know, there most of the people that I that I talk to um, about the Seahawks draft, you know, what you want to see them do, and we put the question out to Twitter, and and the overwhelming response was get an offensive lineman, right? If they didn't have a specific player in mind, just get the offensive line because it's a position that this franchise has not invested a ton in, especially on the interior. I, I'm not going to say that on the tackles. These did top you just, 10 picks did you have like a, a like red flash of Tom Cable there? Like yeah. Oh my God. That's you got a trigger warning me before you throw Tom Cable out there. Right. Like, Oh yeah, no, no, no. This guy played basketball. He can block this guy played uh, defensive line. Defensive line for one I'll just, year. Just let me get my hands on him. I'll, I'll coach him up. Yeah. Motherfucker. That worked when you were allowed to like chop block engaged right. defensive line <laughs> or just one guy works. And then they're like, we could do it again. Like we'll That's do it. Right. We'll do yeah. it again. We'll do it again. It's like the totally. one outlier. Tom, you're chasing. Yeah, Tom Cable made a lot of money off of that. But to, to me, the the point that I'm trying to make is that I so uh Troy Fatanu was the guy that I mocked to them and, oh, and was kind of my my pick. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. that and that would have been fine. So my question to you is looking at your draft board, would you rather like did the Seahawks do better by not going offensive line in the first and then getting a player like Christian Haynes in the third versus going offensive line in the first versus and then taking whoever you would have had the best interior defensive lineman in, in the third. I for where yeah, you know, this was this was ideal. I think they got defensive tackle one and they got a guy I'm personally very high on Christian Haynes. I had I had a second round grade on him. Everyone uh, seems to be. Yeah, he no, he's cool. <laughs> he's a cool player. <laughs> so how it ended up is and I, hopefully I, I'm gonna guess this was this was their process, but there was a drop off defensive tackle wise. You know, there was only really two premium defensive tackles if, if with Newton from with Illinois Newton, being yeah. the other one. But then you, there's kind of a drop off. You got to more role player types and move around guys and squint. And that's a tweener like Brandon Dorless for Oregon. You know, he was interesting to me, but that's like, yeah, if you run a certain defense, yeah, that can work for you. Um, Murphy was the premium guy. I think a lot of us consider him a blue chipper of this draft. There's only so many first round grades. I think he was one of them. And to me, Haynes, like a unanimous first round grade, right? Yeah. It, it was like, even the lower people on him were like, well, so I still consider him like top 25, you know? So mm-hmm. it's not like that. Usually that means like maybe the next tier, but that's a high end next tier, if that makes sense. But yep. I think how this unfolded, cause I think Haynes is a day one starter with that. Actually, I, I for some reason, he started 50 something games at UConn. He's smart. Uh, he's long, he's, he's got good technique. And then it's like, okay, so he started all these games. Is he undersized? Is he, you know, like, the, the, and then he, he just crushes the senior bowl, crushes the combine tests like a freak. And to me, it was kind of like, all right, he checked every box. Like, what are we doing here? Like, cause he's, he's a yeah. smart player. He's a tough player. He he's athletic. The only thing that he struggles with is a little bit of bull rush, but he's so athletic that he can readjust and bend and kind of hmm. like forklift him up. I, I really like him. I, I think he's. I think he can start at guard. I actually, it's funny. I I kind of consider him like a, a version of Shaq Mason, um, uh, who's yeah. Been That's yeah. kind of his style. Cool. Uh, That's yeah. fun. Yeah, can maybe bigger defensive tackles might give him an issue, but he's such a dynamo in the run game, and he, he just does a lot of other things. He's athletic, so I'm a big fan. I really am. I think he, I had him like 32 on my big board. Yeah. Like, okay. God, I love to hear that because I was going to yeah. ask you where you oh, had him ranked. It. And oh, Mina and was me, freaking out. Mina was like, she was like, because she knew I liked him, so yeah. she found one of my tweets right away, and she was just yeah. like, yeah. So like, she was like, I don't know about him, but I know Nate likes him. <laughs> so so she, yeah. Uh, but she I was said, like, yeah. She sent me. Up. She sent me and Danny your tweet oh. right after right after the pick. Like yep. that is, I mean, my my thought on Haynes. I didn't spend a lot of time talking about him leading up to the draft 
because I didn't think there was any chance he would be there for Seattle unless they traded back into the second round. And so I just was like, yeah, great player. No chance. And then all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> he's still on the board after day two. Wow. Yeah. There's no way he's fallen another 20 picks, like, you know, know, whatever. And then sure enough, he's there. And at that point I'm like, please, dear God, draft this guy. And, and, and they took him And And to me, I think that this was Seattle. I think one of the things that benefited Seattle in this draft is there, it was so deep at three premium positions. We saw six quarterbacks on the first 12 picks. We saw, I don't know how many, what we see seven offensive linemen and tackles, seven tackles. I think in the first round, Seattle, assuming Abe Lucas's health has their tackles. We saw seven wide receivers in the first round. Seattle is as good at wide receivers. Any team in this NFL right now, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, (laughs) Jackson Smith and Jigba. And then you mentioned it, the best player of the group, Jake Bobo, right? So uh, it's (laughs) (laughs) so like, they're fine there. And so the benefit of that is yes. Okay. These other teams can play catch up at those positions, but it's pushing players that are, you know, I, I thought Christian Haynes was a top 50 player. 32 is awesome to hear. That's higher than I had him. But I thought yeah. he was a top 50 player. It pushes these guys down because these quote-unquote premium positions were so deep. I shouldn't right. say quote-unquote. They are premium positions. We're so deep this year that it created opportunities for Seattle. So I'm yeah. like you. I, I am thrilled with how they left the first two picks and or the first uh, two days of the draft in and, you know, people say, ah, man, they only had two picks. That sucks. Well, realistically, they left the first two days of the draft with Byron Murphy, Leonard Williams, Sam Howell, and Christian Haynes. And and that has to be kept in mind. I think they did pretty well on that. But then day three, there's some guys that people aren't as familiar with. And, and they, I don't necessarily need your in-depth on each of these guys. But mm-hmm. Mike, if you would re- read out the players that Seattle drafted on day three and then Nate, tell me who stands out to you. Who do you like? And then if there's anybody that you feel like, you know what? I I don't love that guy. Tell us that too. Absolutely. In round four, they took linebacker Tyrese Knight out of UTEP and tight end AJ Barner out of Michigan. In round five, they took corner Nehemiah Pritchett out of Auburn. And then round six, they took three guys. They took a tackle who they'll play as a guard, uh, Satawa uh, Lomea out of Utah Cornerback DJ James out of Auburn and tackle Michael Jarrell out of Findlay. Yeah, I know one guy I already like because I had him in my top 100. Ooh. And that is AJ Barner. I, yeah. Uh, yeah, he's your Kobe Parkinson replacement. Uh, that's him. Uh, I mean, I that's one for one role. <laughs> that is wow. exactly what he is. So uh, I he's a he's a why. He's a good blocker. Uh, and I and he didn't test exceptionally well. I think he ran a four eight and change. But he's got good hands. He's auxiliary target, just like Parkinson was. Um, Mm -hmm. I think Parkinson maybe has a little more juice. But it's, Mm -hmm. yeah, but good player. I really liked him. I know, like, limited upside player, but this guy can play snaps for you, especially what they want to do on offense. Um, Because, you know, Noah Fant is Noah Fant. uh, Sometimes don't want him blocking in line. So you get Barner to kind of unlock other things of your offense. And if you want to get into two tight end looks, like he can kind of keep that going. Like uh, I know Waldron's gone, but in case you do want to keep that going with the new regime. So mm-hmm. he uh, he's the one that right away, that that's also why I was like, I like this class. It's pretty easy when you take one of my favorite guards, take I think my second defensive player on my board, maybe third. Uh, yeah. And also that's another thing. You were just talking about it, like opportunities for the other players. The first 14 picks were offense, weren't they? So mm-hmm. when you are a team that's like, oh, like so many teams thought Latu and Murphy were going to be gone by then or a corner. I mean, look at like the Eagles. They got- uh, Give me a break with they the got Eagles, Quinion Mitchell man. Without having to do anything. It's because there was such a rush on the other positions. That's what happened. Quinion Mitchell is like a top eight pick last year. Yeah, and it, and it goes to the perfect defense for him with Fangio. It's like just like not, it's not even fair. And then they get Cooper DeGene, which is just like yeah, who I had as a top twenty player. So it's they got two top point twenty players. But that's the thing. So when you're sometimes picking later, you can let the draft come to you. It's always sometimes that happens. Like how oh, the Patriots stay so good? How does this team stay so good? Sometimes you let the it's you know a little game theory. Let others make the mistake for you. <laughs> then I kind of sometimes that that kind of works for you a little bit uh, at some of these spots. As far as uh, other guys from that the day three class, I know um, Dane Brugler, who I do uh, the athletic with. He's our the athletics draft expert. I think the best in the biz. Uh, uh, I agree. Easily. I agree. I think I think it's I think it's him, you, and Danny Kelly in terms of like. 
Yeah, in, ter- in terms I think of Dane's in the zone. guys that are like... <laughs> Dane's Mahomes. <laughs> Dane, Dane, well, because Dane has this unbelievable ability to like intuit how teams want to draft uh, yeah. or, or address their draft. Yep, yep. And also, he knows how to... He has so much information. I mean, if you see the beast, and he knows all of it offhand, almost all of it offhand. Um, how, he's the best at just going, okay, I have 40 things to say. All right. Here's the two, and this is what, this this is a great synopsis for this player. I should learn from this, but Dane is really good <laughs> at just kind of going. I have forty things. These are two things that are going to paint the picture of this player, which I think is brilliant. Like that he's able to do it about hundreds of players on the fly, right. like we do it on that show. Um, he he's phenomenal. The first night of the draft, I probably shouldn't talk. He didn't have internet access on his laptop, so all the info that he just rattled off on our show, which is just thousands of things just all off the top of his head, which is just like, I mean, he had some of his notes that didn't need internet, but still it's like, he couldn't look up certain things if he had it like I could. Uh, so yeah, just the best of the best, but he really liked DJ James. Uh, DJ James was a top hundred player for him. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I looked at him as more like a fourth rounder, but still, uh, yeah, got him in the sixth round. Oh, a guy that we both thinks has a chance to maybe be a, a, a kind of a second tier corner or a you know, second corner for you. Um, getting in the sixth round with some traits, playing the high end, high end ball, does some nice things. That's another player that kind of like. And then I don't want to say any that I want to get negative on because it's day three. It's kind of once you get into day three, it's just you got educated darts, you got stupid darts, you got fun darts, confetti darts. Like just you got a little bit, of, you got a little bit of everything here. So. uh uh, I'm not gonna like bash any of them. I, I always like the offensive line ones because then you you know the offensive line coach is the one that picked them, and you can see what this <laughs> right, off- right. You, you can see what this offensive line coach likes, and I think he I, I think he likes some beef. You know one one player that I was like higher on I think the most I, there's a lot of people that I uh, respect that, that follow the Seahawks and analyze the Seahawks that were down on Tyrese Knight. I, I'm a big believer, like, it's it's so easy to fall in love with traits, and it's not like he's devoid of them, certainly, but I, I am a believer that betting on college production is not, like, a terrible way to go, and Tyrese right. Knight led all of FBS in solo tackles last year. The Seahawks, letting go of Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner, don't really have starting off-ball linebacker outside of the two one-year contracts they brought in, Tyrell Dodson and Jerome Baker. So uh, do you see Tyrese Knight as like a guy that has a chance to be a part of a Mike McDonald uh, defense, or is he just like, hey, we're going we're gonna to take a shot, and if it works out, it works out? I, th- I think it's, it's a little bit of both. I, I think what I've learned is, and really this is, it's a story for another time, but li- there's a you know there's a nader of linebackers right now. Like we are in a we are in the what's the opposite of the golden era, the the black <laughs> era, the dark ages. Yeah, we're in the ice age, man. They're in the ice yeah. age of linebacker. They're player. the running we're, back of the defense. Off ball linebacker has become the running back of the defense, where so it used to, to be the main the guy. The you get your one. middle linebacker, your Mike Ditka, your yep. Ray Lewis, your Luke Keekley, your Bobby Wagner, you. Build your defense around them the way you used to build your offense around the running back. Well, all nope. these prospects are getting lighter and lighter. It's and crazy. That's no true. Heft. No heft. I just man. watched all of them. I mean, yeah, the, this was the lightest defensive back class ever drafted, and and it one of the heaviest offensive line classes ever drafted. So, uh, but no with linebacker plays. So just how they have to play in college too. They have to play such mm. a different game they do in the NFL. They don't have to take mm-hmm. on a fullback. You know, I know not every team has a fullback, but they have to take on those type of lead blocks at times from tight ends and stuff. They don't take on certain types of runs, duo runs as much. Like they don't have to like fit up on them. They have to run side to side. So let's just convert this 218 pound safety, 220 pound safety and let them run around a little bit. So interesting. A a thinking, yeah, kind of a theory of mine now is just to take bodies at linebacker. (laughs) Like once you get into round three, round four, round five, it's, you just need, it's just like offensive line. You need warm bodies. But you can't just keep going like, oh, this guy got hurt. Let's sign this guy off the street. This under this guy that was a, a free agent, you know, a week ago. That's where teams you see them kind of fall apart is because they have to dip into that. I would say mm-hmm. a team like the Bills, um, who lost who lost Matt, uh, Matt Milano last year, they were able who's phenomenal. They were able to kind of like hold up because they had a third round pick that was decent. Uh, and actually, one of them now was on your guys' team. They had uh, they had other yeah. kind of guys there that yeah, could it play. Sure is. They're not just random dudes, like, you know, create a player that you signed off the street. It's actual guy you invested in that's part of our defense. So 
I've really, I've really become a more of, you don't take them in the first round, maybe not even the second round, but you got to take them. Like you have to draft, you have to invest in a little bit into them because it's just hard to find them right now. Mm -hmm. Nate, before we let you get out of here, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up. Feels like every, <laughs> I know what you're going to say. It oh. feels like every year we talk about this being the deepest uh, and most exciting wide receiver class that we've ever seen. But this year, it feels like it's lived up to the hype. There's just a variety of prospects, all types of flavors for any which team. Uh, just exciting guys across the board. Two of which happen to attend the University of Texas. And Jackson and I have gone back and forth. He's a worthy guy. I'm an A.D. Mitchell is. guy. Of course he is. He's listening to this guy. I've heard through the grapevine, Nate, that you're more of an A.D. Mitchell guy as well. So please, for me, for the people, for the entire world, tell Jackson why he's wrong about prioritizing Xavier Worthy over A.D. Mitchell and what you think about Worthy's fit in Kansas City at 28 and Mitchell's fit in uh, in Indy at 52. Uh, not only am I like kind of an AD Mitchell guy, I'm like an anti worthy guy. <laughs> so let's go, not, dude. Come on. All right. let's go. All right. he, was, All right. he was outside my top fifty completely. Okay. Uh, I I thought the one sixty five showed up more than the four two one. That was okay. that was kind of how it, when I watch him. I will say better route runner than he gets credit for. Um, some of the deep ball stuff, I just think through contact, he he can't bring it down. I don't see like a baseball player. There. My love for worthy has nothing to do. It's with all his yak. Deep Deep it's all speed. yak stuff, right? Yeah, and that's this is what this is. South yak and separation. I the, I am the yak a separation guy over everything. I he's going to go to the one place where he'll succeed, which is why uh, me being low on him is going to just bite me in the ass. <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, it was like when IU got drafted. Oh, for the 49ers. oh, you mean the two time defending champions traded yeah, yeah. up with to get awesome this guy? quarterback uh, that's going to like put every terrible. ball on the money? Um, yeah, that was like yeah when IU got drafted. I was like, so like this guy's going to fail in thirty places. He went to the one of the two places. He's not only going to succeed, but he's going to become pr- freaking Brandon Ayuk. Real um, quick, if if the 49ers trade him to just random team, is his production going down like dramatically? I think he'll be okay. Debo would be the one, actually. Because yeah. Debo, they use him perfectly. And perfectly Debo's just such yeah. a unique player. And yes, he's a superstar at that role, but it's... It's a particular role. Every like it, year. Oh, this guy, Malachi Corley. Oh this is God, the Debo. Man. LaVisca Chanel. This is There's Debo right Samuel. Now. It's like uh, everyone Bird, that ever Luther lined Burden up in the year. backfield in oh. college is the next Debo Samuel. It's unbelievable. It's like no one could think. If when tight ends came out, everybody was Gronk or Aaron Hernandez. Like just for like five, <laughs> for like seven years, you were one of those two. <laughs> right, right. Those are only two tight ends you could be. Yeah, it was Gronk or Aaron Hernandez, but uh, I don't think I can say one of those names anymore. But the uh, but it's no Luther Burden for next year's draft class is the one guy that's like getting called the Debo guy. Sure, uh, but he's not. It's going to happen uh, every year until he retires. He's not. But okay. But going to the flip side, uh, Ad Mitchell. I know there's just like there's inconsistencies with him, but you can't teach what he does. And it, that's his ball skills, and that's his his actual range for the football. I think. Uh, he has one of those things where he's such a good athlete, and actually Julio came into his problems sometimes, um, not comparing him to Julio, but just like they're so fast that sometimes you watch them on film, they're like, oh, they're jogging. Mm-hmm. And then you like look at him compared to everybody else, and you're like, oh, he's just such an easy mover that he's yeah. – he, and so it's yeah. something I had – I didn't like him originally. I had like a third-round grade on him. I was like, nope, I know he's inconsistent. Then when I get into this process, I'm watching like a game or two, all 22 during the season. I'm watching a lot of all, a TV copies. Once the season ends is when I like, okay – Here's four games. Here's five games. Here's six games in a row. I watched him. I was like, okay, uh, okay, okay. Like you're just catching everything and you're jumping around for everything and you can run a full route tree. It's just that you're like, you're running like real routes. Uh, like he had more to him on top of, and then he, I knew he would test like a monster. It, that shouldn't have surprised anyone. And he has the height. Jackson, you might know this. Anyone that's ever listened to me on any show. I, pre- I prefer size. I, yep. and if, and yep. I prefer if you have size, speed, and what I think is good film, and when you kind of ex- like really put it down, and if you're taking them in the freaking second round like this, yeah, like it's worth definitely worth the swing. I understand the concerns, but where he ended up, the situation he ended up, I actually really like it for the Colts. Obviously, like they actually they both ended up in great spots. Mike is bursting at the seams here, and I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna let him. He's ready to explode. Here's the one thing that I will say yeah. before I give terrible the floor, statistical back to, profile. Back, I know. Back, oh my god. <laughs> I know. Oh my god. It's, it's just atrocious. atrocious. It's the atrocious. heart versus. He's the biggest heart versus head guy. He is yes. my. 
It's one and, of those. And, and look, I, I hedged look, a little bit because I at one point I was like, I'm going to put him over Brian Thomas. And then after a while, I was like, we're going to cool down a little bit, Nate. We'll just drop him just a little bit further. But it, it's uh, so I hedged it. You know, I had him like in my 20s, but it was just like, yeah. you know, this guy, he has the upside of a true number one that like like he has it dude like, and that's look that's just hard you take the top you take the top one percent outcome of ad mitchell's career yeah. and the top one percent of xavier worthy i'm taking i'm taking ad mitchell like you're there's only two people who love dk metcalf more than me and it's dk metcalf and dk metcalf's mom they're like i'm i'm there but i also understand he is a complete outlier like you are betting yeah. on outlier because at the end of the day, for me, you're a size guy. I'm a separation guy. Right. I want I want the receiver that's winning the game a tag, right? This is the guy you can't touch because I think that's where the NFL is going. I think it's why we see a Devontae Smith and a Tank Dell be able to be immediate contributors in this league despite being smaller when there's no way that would have happened 15, 20 years ago. The, my, my thing is that they were in the same system with the same quarterback running the same routes and Xavier Worthy just absolutely outproduced AD Mitchell in every regard except for touchdowns, which I'm not sure how sticky that is. It's the same reason I like Jalen McMillan over Jalen Polk coming out of UW is because when mm. they were both on the field together, there was like an extra 50% of production. How you worked out, Jackson. From, you ever watched a combat the- sport? You know those weight classes, right? <laughs> You know, I get uh, that. Uh, yeah, I get that, that. But I'm saying this is where the NFL is going. So anyway, Mike, the how did Tank Dell end the season last year? That's what I'm saying, well, he, dude. That's what I'm saying. Your little 165 bird okay, that's a, receiver is going to They had one. him block. They had him there's blocking an outside linebacker on a goal you line. You can't play. do it. You're going to ask him not to do it. So yes, now, now, we're yes. Gonna take you are not going to ask Xavier Worthy we're, to be a goal line blocker. I think that's reasonable. So, uh, can't run it. Can't run it can't run it because how about not there. taking plays off how can't about run. how about oh i'm not one of, i'm not the first Anthony read Richardson, so reggie I'm wayne's gonna, gonna, gonna run my him. route reggie wayne's gonna get it out of him reggie wayne's gonna get i do him. love yeah. ad mitchell in indianapolis because he's not the number one this is the one thing that i said in right. during the draft is that you can't have ad mitchell step in and immediately be the number one wide receiver in no. your room because i i don't believe in the work ethic and right. i hope he proves me wrong i'd love him in I, I want him because you have a for the bills pro because i yeah. wanted a quarterback that gets up his ass that that is that's what i think he needs and i actually think he's gonna respect the fuck out of richardson because i i think that's what he gets there he's Absolutely. gonna respect him more to quinn ewers so i think that that's a <laughs> yeah. and, and Reggie Wayne, like I really believe in that kind of stuff. You have to get hey, those, that's a you get those great, inconsistent that's guys. a great point. And I'm a big Shane Steichen guy, man. I think I, I think him. I saw everything I needed to see from <laughs> Indianapolis and Philadelphia <laughs> last year to the moon. to be a big. <laughs> dude, I think Shane Steichen's like the next Kevin O'Connell at like low low end next Kevin O'Connell. Agree with everything you said, Nate. Like build an X in a lab, right? Yeah. Like just the blueprint. The blueprint. The, th- the last thing I wanted to leave this on with Xavier Worthy, right? I, I'm i with you. You know, the drops show up on contested catches and all that. I just think there's a little more Marquez Valdez scantling to his game than a lot of people want to admit. But he just happened to go to the place where you can win back-to-back Super Bowls with right. Marquez Valdez scantling. So Yeah, he's like a mix between MVS and McCore Hardman. Give me a break. Yeah. Give and who cut the game when he touched down? Stop it. McCall Hart. Stop man. it. And that's all, all right. we're All right. Before. All right. Not the Look. drops before. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, Nate, we promised you a tight 45. We're at like an hour Never. 10. Because Never. Easiest bet in sports, the over for Nate Tice. <laughs> Take the over. It's Take the over bet on sports. Nate Tice. Well, here's the thing. This is, and, and look, this is just an aside. The the reason I love doing this show is that I get to talk to the smartest people in the game and just talk ball, but there are very few that I like talking ball more with than Nate Tice. So the last thing I'm going to ask you before we get out of here is just real quick, give me your top two to four teams that you think crush this draft and your bottom two to four that you're just mm-hmm. like, what are you doing, man? You just set yourself yeah. back. Oh, well, the Falcons, if it, that was obvious for the, the negative sense there. Uh, but I, I would say the positive one, I really liked uh, the Steelers uh, just because they, they had some some beef and they, they needed some beef. And I like that, especially if you're going to start Russell Wilson at quarterback, which I think they're going with. I think Fields is going to be more of an interesting Taysom Hill type. Like they, they're going to go, okay, we have Russell Wilson. You need pocket. <laughs> you need an operation for him to work out of. And I think Arthur Smith 
you know, good or bad, it's going to be good because he he's going to pound that rock there. So their draft hall overall, I just really really liked. Um, there's, I mean, the Bears are pretty hard to to uh, say they didn't have a good class. When well, they take yeah, Caleb Williams and, and <laughs> easy, easy when you have two of the first nine picks, <laughs> I, but yes, I, I think I mean it's kind of one of those where it's like, yeah, I guess that one. Uh, actually, you know, I'm trying to think who else. You know, the 49ers had like a hit and miss draft for me. Um, where I think they reach on a couple guys, but then they take Malik Mustafa, uh, who I really, really liked from Wake Forest. So, but then they, you know, Ricky Pearsall was I, I, I liked a lot. First round like no, so like it's kind of like that's always kind of seems like the 49ers, whereas there's some reaches and then there's some where like, I really like better. As a Seahawks fan, I was really glad they didn't take Xavier Leggett there. Yeah, well, that's see, that's the thing. It's like Xavier Leggett everywhere. I don't like him for the 49ers. He's gonna like make it work and just be terrifying for the next. 10 years like that that's just what Kyle Shannon exactly. does currently um man who else did I like I, I've been so like just talking about like certain teams that I just feel like I just got to talk about I like I kind of like the Packers because they did their own thing I think they just took a couple guys I liked and that's like always like yeah 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 you're pretty good but then I look <laughs> I, I look at it afterwards I'm like it wasn't that good um I'm sorry All right, no this will be good content uh let me see who else did I like let's just find the Eagles team. come on Come on, the Eagles. Eagles, yeah, Eagles. I did like the Eagles. Uh, the Bills did some. I mean, I actually kind of like T- Keon Coleman for the Bills, and but the, oh, also I they love like, him for the. Yeah, I didn't. He like you're like saying with everyone. like Xavier Leggett or like Xavier Worthy. I I feel like Keon Coleman is one of those guys where in the like if he went to the Panthers, like a lot of people were mocking hate him it, to hate it. He's he's DOA. Yeah, but. You send him to the Josh Bills, Allen. and it's like, oh, I can see this. And he hasn't had that type of player. And everyone's like, no. oh, oh, they're replacing no. Gabe Davis. It's like, no, Keon is a different player mm-hmm. than Gabe Davis. Mm-hmm. Gabe Davis is like MBS. <laughs> Keon is like uh, Sean I think Cap. Brian Thomas Jr. was the most Gabe Davis-y yes. guy in this draft. I know, funny. I know. I know. Trent Palke and receiver. Or Trent Palke is the <laughs> funniest. I, I actually hope he's still in the league forever because it's just like he gives me material, uh, like just endless. Yeah, they actually did okay, and then they like then they just couldn't help themselves and just overdrafted a bunch of guys because they just can't. Yep. I actually did not like the Panthers overall um, draft because <laughs> Jonathan Shocker. Brooks, like the player, why are you taking him? You know, especially for where you're at, like it just moves like that. Even Trevin Wallace. There are 31 teams that could have used Jonathan Brooks better, <laughs> and who like, needed why? him more than and the they Panthers needed up. him. And they traded up. Yeah, and that was the other thing. It's like they need a talk. Like it's all about your team situation. They're the ones that just need talent. So like, just like all right, just take guys. Don't move up for a running back. Uh, I'm a big yeah. proponent. I don't. I don't hate players. I hate draft position. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, and I love it. Jonathan Brooks. Like I, I love I, I him. I really liked him too. Don't it, love him in Carolina. <laughs> I know. The I um I didn't really like the Broncos. Like I, I like okay cool again. Actually, that's a, that's a lie because they draft Bo Nix, which I'm like. Pfft. But then they go yeah. Jonah Ellis, Same. who I really like. Yeah, I like Trey Franklin, even if he's skinny and he has. Oh my like, god! Took, in the fourth, yeah, in the fourth, it's amazing. Like, and then yes. they, they take Audric Estime, who I actually really like too, even with the Love after him. So, but they take him in the fifth. So it's like even if you have concerns on him, like where he, I was high on him, but it's like okay, if you take him in the fourth, he'll go in the fourth. Give him the fifth. That's a guy that has three down put, run back potential, like hundred percent. So you take that. So actually, there's he's Jordan Howard with a little extra juice. <laughs> that's a good one. The so it's like that's what a lot of classes were for me. It was just kind of all over the place. So it's always been hard to kind of go like, oh yeah, I love theirs, hated theirs. Dolphins had a funny like a a Dolphins draft where it's kind of yeah. they're they're gonna play the game like Madden a little bit. So it, again, some of these teams you can't ding them all the way because some things are right, but some things they just go rogue on. Do yep. like what the Patriots' philosophy was. Take May. I do too. And just load do up too. offense. Get them guys. Just help them out. Just help this guy yes. out. Like, fi- even if they're yes. not great, all awesome A guys, it's like just help bodies. Just something that competency on that side. So, Patriots. Well, and got, Javon like, Baker was a guy that I was really high on. Out Like, once you get out of the top two to three tiers of wide receivers, and you're like, who am I going to take a shot on? That's I it. really, really, really like Javon Baker. And it's like, production there's opportunity and there. That's it. Yeah, like that's, if he that's... if he went to the Eagles, the the you know uh, another guy I really like was Malik Washington who goes to Miami. You're like, well, I... shit, where's his targets going to come from? But like, you put Javon Baker on New England, like that guy. There is there is a one in four chance that Javon Baker leads the team in targets next year, right? And what also skill sets perfect for May. Like, and I also mm-hmm. think it's very interesting. The Eagles went 
hey, Javon Baker and Deontez Walker, who was Drake May's teammate, have very similar player style, play styles. I mm-hmm. think I, I watched enough May tape to know what Tez Walker was. And so I'm kind of <laughs> glad they, I, I'm just glad they didn't do the corny thing where they're like, yeah, we're getting this college teammate for him. They're like, no, we're getting uh-huh. the actual, for, they're actually getting the better player. Broncos. Right. Right. <laughs> kind of. Right. I know. <laughs> Except they, they stumbled into the right guy there. They did. The Broncos. Did. The Broncos. Right. They're like, that, but that's my theory is that Sean Payton only watched a couple quarterbacks. So his receiver scouting <laughs> was just the receivers they were throwing to. <laughs> so he only watched Oregon and Washington and maybe like, maybe like Michigan. Like, so yeah. he's like, all right, it's Roman Wilson. It's the three Washington guys and it's the two LSU guys. That was like his receiver scouting and a, and a Troy yeah. Franklin. Yeah. Well, listen, Nate, this has been a blast, you know, in a perfect world. I think you and I would just sit here for four hours and talk yeah. about this draft, but we got lives to live. And I know that this is the busiest time of the year for you. It means the world that you carved out an hour and a half of your day to sit and chat with us, man. Thank you so much. No, thanks for having me. This is the best. <laughs> i appreciate it clip that mike hey listen before we get out of here where can the people listening find more of you uh first off you can uh, hear me on the athletic the athletic football show uh with robert mays then you can r- read my writings uh i just did a 2025 big board super so. talented writer for especially for a, a former athlete who usually oh, us God. former athletes stink at writing not you it's uh it's it's just plugging. It's just volume. It's just I'm a volume <laughs> shooter. It, writing is praying. The Xavier praying. worthy of literature. You're the Dion Waiters of NFL writing. <laughs> it's I don't even know if that. I would say like last year Josh Jacobs or I'm like Rashad White of writing. Just pure <laughs> you love volume. Rashad White so much. I do. I do. You it works for me. It worked. It, it worked. did work. <laughs> it did work. God in one of it. our leagues, in one of their our leagues, I'm sitting at 109 in our dynasty league, and I'm like, oh my god, Garrett Wilson is still on the board. Like, there's no way. How is he still there at 108? And then Nate texts the group, I'm sprinting to the podium. I'm like, fuck, there goes Wilson. And you took Rashad White, and it worked out. It worked out. It worked out. Hey, champion in one of those leagues. So yeah, yes, oh, that did. big board is on Yahoo, by the way. <laughs> mm. uh, but you can read me there, and then Twitter stuff, Nate underscore Tice. I'll be at the Kentucky Derby this weekend, so you might get a oh my god! Of Kentucky. I love yeah. your life so much. That, oh, hey, I'm, Nate, I'm we appreciate you, man. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. No, that's a lot of fun. All right, y'all. That's going to do it for today. A huge thank you to Nate for making the time. And as always, you can find Mike and I on social media. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J A C S O N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Mike is on Twitter at, at Mike Barwin, and the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts and find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. This episode is brought to you by Glenfiddich Premium Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. I've long been a huge fan of their lineup, and we are thrilled to have them on board as a sponsor of the show. If you're watching on YouTube, you've seen me enjoying a glass of their 15-year Solera cask. If you want a scotch that combines an initial kick with an incredibly smooth finish, then Glenfiddich is for you. And one of the great things about a great scotch is how well it plays with a good cigar. And speaking of, we do have our own special release of cigars that you can purchase at a terrific price as a listener of the show. Until recently, you've been able to order your own bundle of 10 for just $169, which is less than half of what these blends sell for in cigars on the open market. But because of the success of the Cigar Thoughts release, we lowered the price to just $149, and that goes for both the originals and the new Cigar Thoughts Red Zone, and we've decided to keep that price there. That's right, only $149 for a bundle of 10. As many of you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thoughts cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link on the show page to get these easy-to-smoke stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf, or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, and we'll send you the details directly. The cigars come with a Bavita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh whether you have a humidor or not. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at fieldgoals.com. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, Drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. 
Please know that by sharing this show on social media and with your friends, give us the juice to keep making this happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. <laughs>